No matter what may come my way, my life is in whose hands? That's right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This morning I'm going to ask for you. I have two scriptures I'm coming from. You know, there's always a back story and then there's a story. So we're going to go to the back story first in Psalm 31. I have passed out some sermon outlines. Um, the praise team doesn't have them um, ushers. They need some sermon out loud. Does everybody get one? Okay, we're going to do some, some work today. So if you sit next to somebody you don't like, you might want to get up and rearrange so you don't have to talk to the people you sit next to today. This is an interactive sermon. So you know, I'm not up here for spectator sport. I know I look good. And my red cake spades are nice. I want to 
says, I run to you, God. And then he said, now pay attention. Get on my level and listen to me. Have you ever needed somebody to just get on your level? And no matter how ignorant or how stupid it was what you were going through, you just needed somebody to get on your level and understand what you were going through. And that's what David was. He was hiding. He was running from King Solomon. He was in distress. People had called him criminally insane. Has anybody else ever been called crazy? I've been called crazy. I've been called crazy. As I think about this week and the, the events of even yesterday with um, Justice for Jordan, and I think about that young man in Florida that was killed for loud music. And then as my mind started wandering back to Trayvon Martin, and this scripture became even more real to me. That we are, only place we have to run is God. We can't run to our judicial system and expect for them to cover us. The only, our only defender is the blood of God. And if we as a people forget that, we have lost all justice. But God is the only justice giving righteous person that there is. And as we turn to God and seek him for our justice, we can't depend upon Florida. I don't want my sons nowhere near Florida. They're too close to the border now in Mississippi and Georgia. But I don't want them nowhere near Florida because Florida doesn't know about our God yet, apparently. But I'm sure that they will. But as I look back on these events, I think God is our righteous bearer. We run to him. Um, we want to fight and we want to scream and holler about this case. But first we ought to go to God and throw ourselves on the mercy of God about this. When I listened to um, Jordan's parents speak, they were so eloquent and so calm yesterday. I was so impressed by the fact that they said it doesn't serve Jordan well to be crazy. It doesn't serve Jordan well to lose our minds and lose our focus. But we must stay focused on the real victory. And we want to serve our child well so we don't want to fall apart. And I praise God for that because so many times, you know, you hear people in the justice system say, I'll never do this. I'll never do that. Instead, they ask for prayer for Michael Dunn. And I ask for prayer for Michael Dunn, just like I ask for prayer for George Zimmerman. Even when you get off the justice system, your life is never the same. Because there is another judge that has all power. And we know that. So it's no need for us to, um, I, I agree we ought to be upset. But we ought to be upset because we live in a system and a world that has created this. It's not just Florida, but it's Minneapolis. We are killing kids every day when you look at the education gap. They might not be murdered by um, shooting in a parking lot, but we're killing them every day when they go to school. We're killing them off. So we are as guilty and as criminally insane as Florida is in our own little way. But to God we trust, and to God we look to. This morning, I want to come from behind the text. You know, there are two sermons when I was in seminary I learned you could preach. And one was called a text-led sermon, where you get a scripture, you get three points, you holler a little while, and you sit down. And then there's another one called life-led. And a life-led one is where God calls us to come from behind the text and offer up our lives as sermon material. This morning, I'd like to offer up my life as sermon material. It's no secret I've had a rough 2013 and, um, and a rough 2012, too. It's been some, it's been some hard times. Um, not hard to the point where you know I thought I would die, but just some difficult times getting it together, staying focused. And if the truth be told, and I'm going to ask y'all to tell a lot of truths today, so if you're uncomfortable telling the truth, um, just kind of shrink in your seat a little bit. Because we're going to tell some truths today. But if the truth be told, a lot of us have experienced times when we felt unproductive and where we haven't been focused and where we've been out of sorts. And for me, I had one of those years. In fact, there were times I was mad at God and even fighting Him about the things that I was experiencing. It was not until I started reflecting at the end of the year in 2013 when the women's ministry did a, a reflection where I started really kind of understanding and putting together what God was doing in my life. You see, he was shifting my season and I was fighting. 
I was fighting all year because I did not want that season to shift. I wanted to stay where I was, and I was resistant. And so it made it a difficult year. Even as early as this year, I found myself still resisting and stressing out over things that God was asking of me. So as I was preparing for this Sunday, I had in mind that I, you know, this is Black History Month. But I figured, you know, we are black, we can preach black history whenever, whatever Sunday we want. We don't have to relegate ourselves to uh, four Sundays in February. So y'all get that sermon another time. Because today we have to talk about my times are in God's hands. Our times are not in, in our control. We must place our times in God's hands and actively participate with God as we progress through the seasons and times of our life. If we are productive and we don't give up, God will reward us. If we grow weary, we may run the risk of missing our blessing, being past due, or our enemies consuming us. Now that is the thesis. Y'all got the whole message right in that sentence. The other scripture that I'm coming from this morning is Galatians 6, 9. Psalms 31 was the backstory, but Galatians 6 9 is really the key scripture today. And that scripture says, Let us not grow weary in well doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. Then there's another version that says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So, what are these uh, times and seasons that we're talking about this morning? What are these times? And if you turn to the back of your um, outline, you can make your own notes there. But as I started decompressing and, and um, looking at deconstructing that scripture, Galatians 6 9, I started saying, he said, let us not be weary in doing good, for at the, in due season we shall reap. And I started looking at that thing called seasons, which I do often. What are seasons? A succession of similar days. I love that. A succession of similar days. There's a purpose for every season. And to perfect the purpose in my life, we don't have any say about our seasons. God controls our seasons. Just like we don't have any say about how cold it's been this year, how much snow we've gotten, God controls all of that. He controls our seasons of our lives as well. To be seasoned means to be rendered competent. So when I look at Selena, I think, is Selena a seasoned lawyer or is he a newbie? Because to be seasoned is to be um, is to become render competent from trial and experience. So how many of us would look at ourselves and say we are seasoned today? In whatever profession, whatever we are, are we seasoned? Are we seasoned Christians today? Because to be seasoned means that we have had a set of experiences that have rendered us competent. A reoccurring period of characterized by certain occurrences. That's what a season is. And then I looked at the scripture and I said, what does it mean when it says in due season? While we were on vacation uh, a couple weeks ago, we did a lot of visiting of friends and relatives, catching up in, in the LA and San Diego area, people we hadn't seen in a long time. And some of the people we seen, we were quite shocked. We hadn't seen them in maybe seven or eight years. Um, and we went to visit Paul's 86-year-old sister, and she wow. looked better than all of us did. You know? So I looked at her and I said, wow, 86 is pretty promising when you look like that. Uh, but then we went to visit her son, and he had been sick for a really long time. And he didn't look anything like we remembered him looking, and that's my son's godfather. But one of the things as we sat down and visited him and visited with Paul's sister, Betty, was they all kept talking about appointed times and seasons. And I kept saying, God, what are you saying to me while we're visiting? Um, one of the things Betty was saying to us, she's 86, and she was, um, she's an ex-teacher, and she was actually caring for her great, great grandchildren and sitting at the table working through some lessons with them, their homework. And I'm like, now what a blessing to have your great-great-grandmother able and competent enough to sit at a table and do homework with you. And she said, well, you know, I just have a season now where I can just give back and where I have the time to work with these kids and their parents need help. And I thought, what a blessing to have that season, but for her to recognize it and not say, I'm 86, I've been teaching kids all my life, I'm going to go home and sit down. I don't want to do that no more. I did that for 55 years. 
but she could recognize that she, there was a season in her life for such a thing as that. And then as we visited with um, Paul's nephew, he had been very, very sick, um, near death sick. And one of the things he said was, in my sickness, I had to retire. But in my retirement, I found that I had more time to study God's word Amen. and to be a perfect Sunday school teacher. Amen. And he said, my goal was to shift. And all these years I worked for the post office, that I could give those years back to God. All those years that I couldn't go to Bible study or I couldn't do this, now I can give those years back to God. Amen. So one of the things he talked about was God has an appointed time for you to reap and for you to sow. Right. And he looked at those times. So when I think about seasons and due season, God has appointed times for us. Yes. He chooses those appointed times. When I think about due season, it suggests a due date. Now we don't get, I think in the library, I don't know how libraries work nowadays, but back in my day, the old three decimal days, Back in those days, you got a library card in the back of your book and it had a due date when that book was due. And if you didn't get that book back, you paid a fine. It was the same. Okay, thank you. I didn't know things changed so much. But when I think about seasons, there's a due date in seasons. And God has a due date for your season. When you borrow money, you're not in charge of the due date. It's the lender that tells you when that money is due and how long you're going to pay. To everything, there is a season. And if you live any length of time, you will get tired of seasons. Tired of giving yourself away. Tired of taking care of others. Tired of church. Tired of your friends. Tired of your job. Tired of your children. Tired of your husband and wife. Tired of school. Tired of being single. Tired of being broke. And the list goes on. I'm sure you all could add to that tired of. But if you live long enough, you get tired in some of your seasons. In our scripture today, Paul is encouraging Christians to keep on doing good, to keep working on building in every season of life. One of the greatest obstacles facing life's challenges is fatigue and discouragement. We can easily lose heart or run out of strength when we come up against the same problems over and over again. You know how sometimes we say, been there, done that, I'm tired, I don't want to deal with that, and walk away. Paul recognized that fatigue and discouragement might cause a Christian to throw in the towel and quit. The enemy loves to distract us. How many of us have been victims to the enemy's distractions? Oh, we can all say amen to that. Paul says, shift your focus. And remember that the scripture says, in due season, so he gives us an incentive to keep us from giving up when we grow tired of fear. He assures us that we will receive a reward. We can experience a harvest in this life. I'm not talking about when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing it will be. But I'm talking about this life. Right now, we can experience a harvest if we learn to cooperate with God. There are many seasons in life. And each one of those successive seasons is calling for you to be productive and to do something grand. I just like that word. I like being productive and doing something grand in every season. When I looked at 86-year-old Betty sitting in the corner, um, and, and y'all from California, y'all know what I'm talking about. She over there on Crenshaw, <laughs> off of Crenshaw Boulevard, not far from the high school. So you know what neighborhood she's in. But when I look at Betty, Sitting over there, house is, house is beautiful, a yard is manicured in the midst of all kinds of chaos. But when I look at her and I say, here's a lady that has recognized her season, and she is living and reaping the harvest of great-grandchildren being productive in school because she knows what her season is. There are many seasons, and God wants us to do something grand with each season. You are called to be a doer. Some of life's seasons ask questions and others provide answers. If you're not careful and in tune, you'll miss out on an important season of your life. You'll say, there was something I was called to do, but I think I missed it. Because see, you can miss a season. You can miss a season. It can go past due on you if you don't hurry up and catch up to what God is trying to do with you. Why not ask the questions for the next season before you get into it? Instead of just living season to season, paycheck to paycheck, 
why don't you look ahead and try to vision and see what God is doing in your life before you get there? What will this opportunity ask of me? What are my gifts? What makes me feel alive? That is why we write vision statements and create vision boards. It helps us discern what God wants us to focus on during these seasons in our lives. The women's ministry had an activity in uh, January where we wrote our vision statements and we did vision boards that we could keep in front of us because we're trying to discern in this season what is it, God, you're asking of us? What do you want us to do? And how do we stay focused and not become weary and fall apart so that we can be productive in this season? I've seen a lot of people, y'all, who can't come to terms with seasons. Young adults who don't understand they are no longer teenagers and still wanting to be their parents to be responsible for their lives or live off of their parents' income instead of their own. I've seen seniors who are not ready to retire. I've seen parents who are unprepared for children to leave home. Many of us have a difficult time with transitions and seasons. I think about you, Deb Ray, when your child went to kindergarten and how you mourn and mourn over him going to kindergarten. <laughs> but it was his season. It was his time. And as Quincy Jones says, everything must change. Nothing stays the same. So we may as well get it in our good heads that nothing stays the same, that there is a beginning and an ending to a, most things in life. It's sad when I see women who can't come to terms with their season. And they're walking around in those band-aid dresses when their season has passed. <laughs> and things are dropping below those band-aids in the grass of it all, or we still want to shop at Victoria's Secret when we know we need something a little more substantial underneath our clothes when our seasons change. Some of y'all might not understand that, but you will. You live a little bit longer, you will understand that. But there's another armor that doesn't, Victoria doesn't sell, that helps the girls and everybody else stand up. That's understanding the seasons of your life. And that's being realistic about where you are in your season. Everybody needs a little help. The worst fool is the old fool. Y'all know that. Y'all been out before and seen an old fool, somebody that's still trying to dress in their pimp club. They're about 100 years old, but they're still trying to pimp. They ain't got nobody to pimp, but they still pimp. And that's when you say pimping ain't easy. You might think you're covered up. But you're not. It's kind of like wearing, we wear coats and boots now because it's cold. Because we recognize this is the season of winter. So we dress warm. But when spring comes, we're going to shed these coats and these boots, and we're going to go for some open toe shoes, hopefully with pedicure feet. And we're going to go with some open toe shoes, and we're going to take our coats off. And that's recognizing that the season has changed, that we, we can't keep wearing our winter coat in the spring, or we look what? Stupid. Well, that's how we look when we refuse to shift with the seasons. Parents, that's how we look when we want to be our kids same age. Now, you got a daughter 20, this doesn't make no sense for you to look 22. At some point, you got to know you got to look 40 so your daughter can look 20. Because you're not 20 no more. Understand that. Can we be honest for just one moment and say, I'm unaware of what season I'm in, if you are. I am not in sync with what God is doing in my life. I have been or I am weary at times, and I've lost focus and become distracted. Can anybody just be honest and say that? Yes. Can, can you just say that, that you've been unaware of the seasons that you're in, you've lost focus? This confession will help you be able to turn yourself around, get focused, and recall the promises of God. The scripture tells us, do not be weary of well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. Life seasons will wear you out. And if you're not in tune with what God is doing in your season, you will die in your season. Based on the scripture, it's clear there's potential for getting tired and weary. How do we deal with these? Do you know what season of life you're in right now and what you're doing in that season? Are you doing something grand in your season right now? 
or are you just lying dormant in your season? Is your season lasting too long? I had one really long lasting season, and I just had to declare to God, God, I'm kind of ready to come out of this season. Now, I really wish you'd be ready with me, God, but if you're not, let me know so I can go back and sit down and try to be productive, because this is a long season. Sometimes we have to ask God those questions and have that dialogue with God. But what does the Bible say about your seasons? And what I'm going to share with you is this is what I know. And this is what I've learned about what the Bible has told me about my seasons. I turned 55 on February the 1st. 55 is a, a good little season life to have some experience and to share some things with y'all. Now I might not be as old as everybody in here. But I'm sure I'm probably old as most of y'all and more of y'all than you think. The first thing I've learned is that God will sustain you through your seasons. In Psalms 31, 14 through 15, David said, But I trust in you, Lord. You are my God. My times are in your hands. He said, My times are in your hands. Both David's times in our hands and our times are marked by instability. The word times refers to the uncontrollable changes of life. The word causes us to reflect upon the instability and changeableness of life. We may think we control our times, but we don't. One day David was a powerful king. The next day he was running for his life from his rebellious son. We never know what changes a season will bring. A few pressure points are predictable, but most of the things that happen in our seasons are not. The predictable changes relate to the fact of ages, aging, and changes in life cycles. Example, some of you may graduate from high school in a few years, um, or some of you may be starting college. Others of you may be starting careers. Others may be entering married life this year. Some of you may be having your first child. For others, your child may be entering school, and still others, you may be saying goodbye to your last child at home. All these changes are predictable, but they'll cause you to be weary at some point and require some adjustment. You may be facing retirement, or you may have retired. That causes, requires some adjustment. Other changes we face will be quite unpredictable and unannounced. They will barge into your life like intruders in the night. It may be your own or a family member's sudden loss of health. It could be the death of a family member. Perhaps an aging parent will require large chunks of your time that you weren't ready to give. Some of us may lose our jobs and with it a large part of our identity. The change in life can put you in tremendous stress, not only the individual, but also on the family. Some of you may find yourself going through the pain of divorce that you never asked for or planned for. Some may be hit with severe financial setbacks, which force unplanned moves. But whether predictable or unpredictable, life holds changes that will produce weariness. Both David and our times were marked by instability. The word times refers to uncontrollable changes in life. He wasn't talking about those times that we could expect, but when he said, my times are in your hands, he was talking about all those uncontrollable things that he had no control over. Now, it's interesting that he used times plural, which meant there are a lot of uncontrollable changes, that there are a variety of casualties in life. Don't just think when you make it over the hump of one casualty, oh, phew, glad that's over. Because you know what? There's always another one coming down the road. Your cycles of life are already set. You don't get to choose your season. So take your watch off because your times are in God's hands. The only watch you need to be looking at is the Word of God and seeing what God is saying to you in your season. We must place our trust in God, which gives us inner stability in the midst of outer stability. In the midst of outer instability. We say that again. We must place our trust in God, which gives us inner stability in the midst of outer instability. Trust is a vital link that connects God's purpose in my life with my season. See, if I don't trust God and I'm dealing with the season, I'm going to do some crazy things. I'm going to act out. 
because I'm in a season that I don't understand and I don't trust God. So if it's a season where I'm unemployed, I may start taking jobs that I don't have any business taking. Or if it's a season where I'm single and I'm starting to feel my biological clock ticking. And I've been there before too. Um, or I might feel like, God, you never going to give me a man. I'm going to have to get out here and find my own man. We start doing stupid stuff like finding our own man and not waiting for God to, to send him to us. That's where David was when he wrote that psalm. He was still in crisis, but he was experiencing God's stability in the midst of what it was, in the midst of his struggle, because he decided that he was going to trust God. Y'all know the old folks used to call it peace in the midst of the storm. That's what they used to call it. I used to say, what is this my mama talk about when she would, it would be crazy in the house and she'd be sitting in the rocking chair saying, I got peace in the midst of the storm. And I was like, well, that's kind of crazy. Everybody else breaking down and she's sitting up here rocking talking about she got peace. But she had a secret that I didn't have and that was that she trusted God for, for what was going on, not herself. The second thing I know is that God will change you during your season if you let him. Now, if you choose not to let God, you will be unproductive in your season. But if you allow God to change you during your season, you will be productive Amen. during whatever season it is, whether it's a hard season, a season of grief, a season of growth, whatever it is, God will change you. Amen. If you don't want to extend the season beyond its intended length, cooperate with God. So if you are going through a season of hardship right now, and you are finding that it's difficult to get out of this cycle of hardship, the best thing you can do is start cooperating with God in your season and not fighting, not fighting the season. That will help you end your season a little bit sooner. Some of us have to go to summer school because we have not learned to cooperate with God. So God says, now you finish this course, but you really didn't pass because you didn't cooperate. So I'm going to extend your season a little bit longer until you get it. How many of us have been in extended seasons? I have lived in some extended seasons of my life that was unnecessary. I didn't need to live in that extension of a season, but I was hard headed and I refused to cooperate with God during that season. It is obedience and willingness to be like David and to listen to the counsel of the heart that will help us end those seasons that are sometimes very painful. Our seasons are purposely designed and created for us. For us, and we are to bring forth fruit in every appointed time. If you submit to God, you should. We should ask God to help us navigate through the seasons in our lives. During God's eternal stream of time, He has ordained specific moments that powerfully affect us. The word the Bible uses for these moments is called kairos, and indicates time is filled with meaning and purpose. Kairos is not about a set hour or a set days from this and this. Kairos is about time filled with meaning and purpose. There are difference-making seasons that transform our lives. God ordains special seasons for us to pass through so we can learn more about Him. One of the seasons that I really learned more about myself and more about God from was the season of having children. There's a lot of things you don't know until you have a child of your own. There's a lot of assumptions you make, a lot of things that you take for granted until you have a child that challenges you or a child that, um, that you have to take care of and you start seeing yourself in that child. You start seeing the good, the bad, and the ugly in that child. And it will challenge you. It will also help you learn to trust God. Because as that child ages and becomes independent and you have to let go, not just letting go of the first day of school, but when you have to let go and let them go and live their lives, whether you agree with the choices they make or not, that will call upon you to trust God. It will call upon you to have a prayer life when you have to trust God with your children. Amen. That's right. There are difference-making seasons, and I would ask, what season of your life thus far has been the most challenging for you and why? I'm not talking about the difference making, but what season has been the most challenging for you? I'm going to ask you to chat with your person next to you or people next to you. Tell somebody about what season 
And if you see somebody sitting there and they're not talking, go find somebody to talk to. But I want you to talk to somebody and tell them what season has been the most challenging for you. It doesn't matter who it is, 
but somebody that you're talking through what's happening in your life so that you can help process what season it is and to help you better cooperate with God. Now, the third thing I know about seasons is God will reward you if you persevere. Psalms 1, 3 tells us, Blessed is the man. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of the water that bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall also not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. A blessed man prospers in everything that he does because he's learned to flow with his seasons that have been uniquely designed for his life instead of working against them. What the Bible calls his season refers to the special timings of the Spirit that God has to produce fruit in you. See, not every year fruit trees bear fruit. There are some years that fruit trees are dormant and they don't bear fruit. That doesn't mean that they're not working or that they're not productive or they're not useful. It's just not a fruit bearing year for that tree. But then there are years where the tree starts bearing fruit and you have to do stuff to nourish it to keep bearing that fruit. So you need to know what season God has you uniquely designed in. And your season may not necessarily be my season. You may be dormant while I'm growing, and I may be growing while you're dormant, but our job is to encourage each other in whatever season we're in. Don't judge, but encourage. If somebody is in a dormant season, then we learn to encourage them in that dormant season. We learn to pray for them, and we learn to pray for fruit, that it will return. Galatians 6, 9 also teaches that there are certain attitudes that must be implemented for you to be positioned to reap when your due season comes. First, the scripture admonishes you not to be weary in well-doing. The word weary means to be spiritless, worn out, or exhausted. How many times the spirit urged you to enter into a new season, but you were too worn out or exhausted to act on it? You know, you could see things coming, and you could see that there was a new season opening up. But you say, no, God, I'm good. I'm good. Just leave me right where I go. Oh, no, God, don't change. Don't change my job. I'm good. I found myself saying that all month in January because we're going through this major reorganization. And I'm like, I'm good, God. I do this job with my eyes closed. And I'm in the season where I really don't want to work that hard. And Lord knows I don't want to travel no more. So, God, I'm good. Don't change my season. But I hear God saying, I'm about to shift. Get ready, or you're going to be really upset when the shift comes. First, the scripture admonishes us to not be weary. And it says, don't fall apart. You must guard against wasting energy in wrong pursuits. Maintain a passion and a zeal about doing good in life, especially if your season seems to be drawn out. A spiritless or lackadaisical attitude will always yield a diminished harvest. So when you have a lackadaisical attitude or you're having trouble getting out of bed and facing the day, and some of us do sometimes, um, when you have that kind of attitude, your harvest diminish. Where God says you will reap a harvest. If you don't have the right attitude, you're only going to get so much of that harvest. But if you create an attitude where you're cooperating with God, your cup will run it over. Are you approaching your season with zeal or has weariness taken over? I'm going to ask you this. Have you experienced the due season in your life? I've experienced the due seasons in my life uh, many times. One of the due seasons I'll talk about since this is Valentine's Day week was uh, my husband. I was 32 when I got married. I've wanted nothing more than kids and to be married probably most of my life. I really wanted kids. And in the times of waiting where I didn't have kids, I became a mother to everybody else's kid in my 20s. I had more kids in my house than the law would allow most times. But I was a mother to everybody else's kids. That was not growing weary and doing well while I was waiting on my due season. I did not physically or biologically have children, but I continued to be there for other children because that's what I wanted in my life. So I made well of the season that I was in. I could have laid dormant and said, well, I ain't got no man, and you know, I'm here all by myself, so let me just go home and let me do it for myself. But what I did was I reached out to other people's children. 
I reached out and became a friend to other people's children, relieved other parents of their children for a night or two, and gave them the comfort. I did well in a season. And then God blessed me with a season of my own where I met a husband and had children. And God will do the same for you in your new season, if you think not. Now some of us go crazy in the season that we're in, and we want, 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 but we don't know how to settle into the season that we're in right now and do the good thing that we should be doing while we're waiting for God to do something else in our due season. So I encourage you to do good in this season, and you will reap a harvest in your due season. But you're not going to do that if you go home and lay down and just complain and get mad at God. So I'm going to ask you to tell each other, have you had a due season in your life? And what did that feel like when it manifested? A due season. A season where you did reap a harvest. Can you think back on a time where you had a due season? Talk to your neighbor. All right, your minute is up to talk about your due season. Did anybody have a really good due season to share? Anybody got a due season that's for yesterday? When you graduated from college last year, that is a due season. And if you know the backstory, you really know why it's a due season. Amen. Amen. We all have due seasons. We don't have to wait until the afterlife to have our due season. Due seasons come now if we cooperate with God. And I ask you, are you approaching your season with zeal or has weariness taken you over? Has weariness taken you over, or are you approaching your season with zeal? How many of us have gotten a little lost in our weariness? I'm going to raise my hand because the day I'm preaching to myself, I'm preaching myself out of my weariness. I've lost my way in my weariness, and I have become unproductive at times because I've lost my way because I got weary. And if we all were honest, we would tell the truth. Um, we need to stop spiritualizing what's going on with us and tell the truth about what's going on with us. I didn't realize how weary I had gotten until a friend visited me last Sunday morning in my office. And as we began to talk about it, I started, she asked me about myself, and I'm like, well, you know, it's easier for me to talk about you and what's going on with you. But since you asked, let me tell you. And when I got through, I mean, she was weary and I was weary. <laughs> Because when you can stand up and tell the truth about what is really happening, and you can tell the truth you need to tell yourself, then you can begin to get healed. Because after I had that discussion Sunday, I said, oh, wait a minute. I said I was depressed. I said I was tired. I was underappreciated. I was sick of work. I didn't really have a lot of good things that was going on in my life that I could really account for. But after I said it, I can begin to say, God, get me out of this depression. I do not want to be clinically depressed. I really don't want to have to rely on some drugs. So, God, I need you to get me up. Yeah. And after I walked out of that, that discussion with my friend, I began to pray. And I said, God, give me something to focus on every day. Tell me how to focus every day to get out of this funk that I'm in. And I began to say, okay, today I choose joy. Good. And regardless of whatever is going on, I'm going to try to be joyful. Now, I got hijacked yesterday, and for about four hours, my joy got taken away, and I got a little crazy. But I went back to my well-doing after I caught myself, because see, sometimes we need to catch ourselves before we wreck ourselves. It's okay, we all gonna have a little slip and slide here and there. That's the understandable. But the thing is, how quickly can we catch ourselves when we find ourselves? So you cannot be healed from the things that you're trying to be healed from unless you are honest. And if we are honest, I'm going to tell you that I have lost my zeal at times, and I have become weary, and I have even sometimes not done well in my well-doing because I am so lack of focus and so weary that I kind of fell off the, the truck, fell off the wagon. Now what God says is that if you faint not, he means if you don't fall apart and go to pieces, we can get weary. We're going to get tired. We're going to get frustrated. But we don't have to fall apart. 
because we know a God that makes a difference. So we don't have to get weary, but he says, you'll be reap a harvest if you don't fall apart. So y'all, we can't fall apart because we want our harvest. So in our weariness, let's get it together. Let's tell the truth, first of all, and then let's get it together. If we tell the truth and we say it openly and honestly, there are people that can hold us accountable. I'm going to ask you to, to make some declarations today. You must resist this negative frame of mind instead and cling to the spiritual law that is outlined in this verse. If you don't grow weary and fall apart, you'll reap a harvest in your due season. You can create your own season by acting a fool. Now, that may not be God's season, but you can create your own season. Now, let me ask this. How many of y'all have been in your own season that you created? <laughs> that you created in those seasons. We can create our own season, and that season is not necessarily the one that God has designed for you. That's the season that you created yourself. An undisciplined and wandering mind will prevent you from flowing with the seasons of the Spirit and get you into a lot of trouble. You all wonder why I'm always talking about let's be focused, let's have goals, let's have vision. Write them down, put them on your mirror. Because when you are unfocused, you will fall to anything. You will fall into someone else's agenda yeah. when you are not focused That's on your right. own agenda. That's right. As my um, freshman teacher told me at Spelman College in 1976, if you don't have an agenda for yourself, somebody will have one for you. You can either follow their agenda or follow your own, but make it up real clear what agenda you're following. And I say the same to you all today. Coming to the realization that your life is out of balance with seasons of God need not be defeating or despair. You can sometimes redeem or buy back the lost seasons by turning your life around and changing your affairs to comply with God. It is never too late to repent and turn back to God. Too many of us are living unfruitful and unfulfilled lives simply because we have adopted a vague and thoughtless way of living. You know how we talk about living from paycheck to paycheck? Some of us live from thought to thought. We don't have any purpose, any vision. We just wake up one morning and say, well, I think I'll do this. Well, I think I'll tell them off. No casualties here. I just feel like telling them off and fighting, so today that's what I'm going to do. What God says is be focused. Don't get weary, but stay on track. Be focused. It's never too late to turn back to God. We are not sure where we're going or what the purpose is for our life. And this lack of clarity is precisely the reason why our minds are filled with confusion and anxiety about the affairs of our lives. How many of us have been in that life of confusion? How many of us are there now? How many of us have confusion and anxiety right now? Just tell the truth. Got some confusion and some anxiety about some things going on in your life right now. Ephesians 5.16 says, live purposefully and worthily and accurately and not as the unwise and witless, but as the wise. As a child of God, you must live your life with a sense of purpose, with the true sense of direction that leads you into the seasons and timings of God, not away from them. But if you will instead focus your attention and apply your energies on firmly grasping what God has for you in this season. Where are your times? Are your times in God's hands? Or are your times in your hands? What is God saying to you in 2014? What harvest do you plan to reap this year? Have you grown weary and lost focus? This morning I ask you, what is God saying to you in 2014? What is the harvest you plan to reap this year? Is anybody um, bold enough to confess it? Anybody bold enough to confess the harvest that they plan to reap in 2014? See, we have not because we confess not. We have to begin to start believing in our hearts and confessing with our mouths that this is what I believe God is going to do for me this year. And if we can't confess it, we will get weary and lost focus, but we have to continue to confess what we believe God is going to do for us. Today is your day. You can repent and refocus today. Even though you've grown weary, you can make a decision today to lean into your season and trust God today. If I'm speaking to you, I want you to stand up where you are, because today is your day. If I'm speaking to you, 
want you to stand up where you are. I put a prayer on this uh, sheet. If you look on the back of the sheet, I put a prayer on the back of the sheet. And I took time to really think out this prayer because it was a prayer that I needed to pray to get myself back on focus. And if you're standing with some of the standing people, I'm going to ask you to find some partners. And I'm going to ask you to read that prayer to each other. Read your prayer to someone else. Oh, 